this effort started, as you know, in 2018 as a as a participatory art project. It became a homeowners group when our current mayor uh, swore um, our chair in and a bunch of other members on the 9th of um, January of 2019. And then, um, you know, a year, uh, 14 months later, after meeting at the Hibiscus Gallery and, uh, and for a long time at Books and Books, before returning to Hibiscus, it went online. Since then, we've been trying to really get a sense of how to um, use this platform, which is really a platform about engaging individuals, um, piquing their curiosity uh, in many ways to become one about educating, sort of sharing knowledge, um, but how we could take this and engage the community with it. And I think um, um, there's there's a couple of things I just you know want to sort of report as an overview. So I, I met with uh, some students at Princeton. You know, they were doing a, a paper for their class. And they wanted to use this as a model for their class. But what they wanted to do was just sort of parachute into a meeting. I'm sorry, parachute into a community without knowing a single person, not a single stakeholder, no one there, and sort of do the underwater HOA. And obviously, you need a little more um, integration and context before just parachuting. It's not like the underwater HOA is not like reading a book. And it's also not about advocacy. It's not just giving people information for them to share. The Underwater HOA is really about de developing social connections and building a community of, of people who, who have shared um, ideas that they, you know, shared interest and uh, problems that they want to solve. I think we can, um, as we try to regroup in real person, come and have an understanding of what the positive things and what the shortcomings are of having a broad open group like ours, where it's not about a community tackling a specific issue, but it's really more like stewards of a community tackling a broad complex countywide issue, which is the size of our underwater HOA membership. Um, I, think, I think the balance that uh, Adam, who um, runs my participatory art project long-term, uh, and I have struck out in developing my practice at Pinecrest Gardens where I'm artist in residence is to create a project that, um, that Brian, in one of our last meetings, we talked about maybe the underwater HOA should plant mangroves. And the idea is something called plant for the future uh, that we're going to be launching uh, next week. It's, it takes plant as a uh, not, 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 not next week. Sorry, next, next month or a little after that probably next month. In fact, we are launching it next month at the opening of the Reclamation Project uh, exhibition on May 8th at the university's Wynwood uh, Gallery for the, uh, the Gallery for the College of Arts and Sciences. But um, just as a way of trying to explain to you, how, you know, where we go, where we go from here, I believe that this model, this sort of idea of people coming together, they can come in and out of meetings, they can come in to listen to a speaker, I think this is a good solid model for a broad based group, right? Uh, we talked about having little committees and different groups that would tackle either specific issues or specific neighborhoods, specifically the Pinecrest Gardens homeowners group. But all of that really is about an individual's resolve to work with their neighbors on an issue that they wanna tackle. So it becomes really personal and really self-driven. Um, but I, I think the power of art just like putting the markers in the front of your house, giving it the name we give it is valuable to convene people. And the way I think we're gonna do that is not by having the markers, which sort of feel like at some point, okay, you put your marker, now what, do I bring it in? You know, th there's, a, there's a certain stagnation with it, is to do something proactive and immediate the moment you put the marker. And that is to um, plant a salt tolerant plant, but not a mangrove, because a mangrove has its complexity and it's slow growing and there's all sorts of issues, but to plant a gumbo limbo or um, um, green buttonwood or um, a sea grape alongside a more elegant marker, something that looks like a garden flag, it'll still have the elevation, but that way an individual can participate by limp literally putting that in their front yard and it's a beautiful you know, it's a beautiful garden flag with a number, a little cryptic, that st still does the trick of engaging people in conversations. They can have their neighbor do it, but it's got this, this actual 
action step that's tangible. Yeah, I'm planting a tree that sequesters carbon. I think it, it's a little more accessible for anyone as opposed to people who have to be in our meeting. It also has the URL and the website that then uses that as a catalyst to bring you in to the underwater HOA. And if you're inspired by what we do here, then you go to the resource page that Jamal is creating. And in there, in time, we will have a toolkit that tells you how to do it. Not like these Princeton kids that we're just gonna improvise, but look, these are the action steps, how you organize for a community. Here are some resources. And importantly, as you remember a long time ago, we had um, the executive director for the Climate Migration Network. Uh, so I spoke to her. They're a very small group. They have one and a half staff members. Jamal has been really active with them as well. I serve on their steering committee, but they would use whatever toolkit we create to organically help a community of already organized residents to bring more awareness and amplify their voices. So I think just to help everyone out and keep a sense of, well, what is this underwater HOA? Because we've been, look, we've been very successful. I think we've changed the dialogue. Uh, um, really, I think, I think objectively, I'm very proud of the work this fully volunteer funded, this fully unfunded volunteer effort, um, you know, has come up with. I'm really, really proud of the work we did. But I also want the, the group that's here to not feel, okay, well, what are we doing? Well, what we're doing is we're bringing you together. We're creating a community of people who care about an issue. And we're bringing experts, like serious experts and people with knowledge and ability and, and, and reach, like um, you'll hear from Teddy's uh, work. His reach is across our entire university community and beyond. Uh, into the conversation in ways that you wouldn't be able to do that. And I think organically in our person-to-person -person meetings, we'll have that ability to then um, um, And yeah, then we can, it'll be a little easier to get into the kind of more right? active things. Because right. it's person-to-person, -person, right? It, it works that way, but no one has to worry about, oh my God, well, you know, where's our membership commit? I mean, it's basically the, the platform is speakers, convening and then individuals on their own can can create what they want to do because it has to be it has to be that way we can't have you know an individual be the community organizer for you know the south miami uh homeowners you know that that's that's what neighbors do out of their own concern that's what civic engagement and involvement is so i think that's i think that's where we're we're going with it i just wanted to give that preliminary uh uh broad view of what we're going to be doing. There's a whole effort that we're going to pull together. Adam and Genesis, who's also on my team um, as, as full-time employees, uh, will be working on that plant project for you. And of course, Jamal, in his capacity as our, our master's uh, intern, you know, um, who coordinates this, is going to get those websites uh, ready for us to go. Any questions or comments around, around that? OK, just wanted to put that out there for you. Adam, uh, currently um, we're back at Pinecrest. Do you want to tell them what you're doing this Monday? I mean, this Sunday? Yeah, um, if you guys remember, we were at the Pinecrest Gardens Farmer's Market every Sunday doing the plant project. Teddy, you got a mangrove and flag from us there, uh, you know, a year and a half ago or however long ago that was. Um, it's been, it was shut down for a while and then it became drive-through. And now as of recently, it's actually walked through again. It's just much more spaced out. So it's not, it doesn't have a bunch of people crowded together. Um, and so this Sunday we're gonna be heading back uh, and we're gonna be doing the Native Flags Project, um, which is, if you guys get the news, if you have seen the, the newsletter that we sent out, it's actually something that you can purchase and we'll have delivered to you. We have uh, four native tree species that we delivered to your house along with um, a flag, a native flag that Xavier, a replica of the native flag that Xavier planted at the North Pole uh, in 2008, along with a pole. So. Um, just this whole package that we are delivering. So anyway, that we're going to be starting that initiative off at the farmer's market this Sunday. Cool. Sounds great. Um, you guys, uh, what's up with all the construction around your the studio there? What's going on? Uh -huh. So Pinecrest Gardens is having a complete, um, a complete makeover. They're um, um, spending a buku bucks to make that whole back area where the, where the petting zoo was uh, and the, um, uh, you know, be, you know, beyond the terrace where uh, you had soft drinks and food, that whole downstairs area is being converted into a state-of-the-art children's center with a place for, for learning, 
Uh, they're also making sure that the entire park, starting with where the cottage was, I'll explain that in a second, and uh, currently, and then this fall in the South Garden, we're gonna make the entire garden ADA compliant. The Hibiscus Gallery has completely been um, redone. It's got a new terrazzo floor. There's been serious construction all over the site. And our beloved little cottage where my studio and my team is based uh, is being moved how many yards, <laughs> Adam? Whatever, uh, yards. two feet, yards, whatever, 20 yards? Yards. Yeah, it's just literally just being picked up and then moved and put back down like 10 yards. So for those of you that know Pinecrest, there's like a little private road. It's basically, uh, it's an, what do you call it? It's an access. A little, it's a little driveway or access, access road. So our, our studio is moved from where it is because that's the new main entrance for this garden. Mm -hmm. And we're just being put on the access road facing out, which will make us even closer to the farmer's market. Um, but there's a lot of there's a lot of dust and construction there until at least uh, November uh, and and beyond. I think I think through 2022. But uh, they're gonna you know they're gonna have a beautiful garden when they're done. And um, not to let the cat out of the bag, but the um, the colonnade itself, the entire colonnade, if you know if you can imagine it, is going to be um, a place where a lot of my uh, uh, botanical environmental bioremediation projects are going to be on permanent um, display. It's just a use, you know, it's a space that's completely underutilized and we're gonna make it a living garden uh, and, and li I'm sorry, all gardens are living. We're gonna make it a living art exhibit uh, showcasing Florida's native plants. And of course the plant project that's been launching. So um, anyway, that's where we are. I think uh, I think we're good to go ahead and get started. Oh yeah, Teddy, we won't keep you on the in the waiting room for so long. Yeah. So let's go ahead and uh, okay. and launch this meeting. If we could have our chair start the meeting, that would be great. Okay, well, let's start the meeting. Although I feel like we're part way into it already, but let's start it with Teddy, uh, our speaker today. Uh, he is, uh, we're real happy to have him come here. He's, you know, huge in the University of Miami community and beyond for sustainability issues. It's, you know, like you have a discussion about, well, let's see, can see what Teddy has to say about this. Well, let's get Teddy involved. That's like the first go-to for everybody. And that's, um, he's, he, uh, you graduated from FIU in like 2010, right? With, uh, with magna cum laude, I, I saw. So we're just a real sharp guy here too. <laughs> and, uh, He's uh, been at the University of Miami since 2014, 13 or 14, and uh, is a sustainability manager and has got his hands in all, all, all that things, sustainability on the campus. And of course that's growing every day and, and the, the, the amount of things that are involved in that. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have him here to talk to us today. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's weird to be here because I remember maybe uh, uh, when I graduated from FIU in 2010. And, and by the way, uh, went back to school. I'm from France originally, so I, I came here. My English was eh, you know, so so. And after 12, 15 years of teaching French, I, I decided to to do something else with my life. You know, I wanted to, uh, you know, be more in tune with my my conviction. So. Uh, I started to go back to school. I mean, go to school because I've never went to school in the U.S. So I um, went to FIU. And that's when um, I, in Earth and Environment, they first gave me this little green flag that says restore native habitat. I was like, eh, for Tata's project. And I started to learn about this guy who's, you know, famous in Miami. So uh, to me, it's it was... A surprise and, and a relief to see him coming to UM three years ago and was like, ah, something's gonna change. And so, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Well, and I forgot to mention that you also teach classes at FIU now. So you've yeah. come back. I, to I used to teach, yeah. I used to teach in the earth and environment. Um, and um, yeah, just, that's what I still do a little bit. I like teaching. Hmm. Um, so, so, I, I have a few slides if uh, I know that uh, most of you know, but I see that some people are, and maybe even you, Brian, you, you know me, but there's some stuff that you may not. Oh, absolutely. Know. We're kind of in our own world over on. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Know exactly. What's going on. Yeah. 
So let me share a, a, a few slides. The first one is not mine. <laughs> it's from Clio. Uh, the best of the best. Uh, they really. I, actually, before I got the job at, at UM, I took their um, climate communicators um, workshop. They gave me the this little certificate. Uh, uh, it gave me the job. Probably. I mean, it was part of the the envelope. So. Um, so yeah, definitely the best climate literacy uh, organization uh, in uh, in our region. Um, and this is a, a little slide that sometimes people you know get confused. They what what's wrong with the webinar? <laughs> wrong. Look at it. Um, so let me make sure it works. All right. So I, I'm going to skip the whole uh, climate science <laughs> portion because you're seeing it. That's uh, something you know. Um, but uh, we, we're going to talk about uh, oh, something is wrong. Yep. We're going to talk about um, kind of uh, what UM has done since 2007 and on. Uh, I came to UM in 2014, and um, a lot of things have changed. So I'm happy about the, the, the way things are, are going. Um, but there's a lot of things to improve also. So uh, everything started pretty much in 2007 when uh, the university signed the uh, second nature american uh, college and university presents climate commitment that's something that honestly most universities signed at the time it was kind of the in the move and um it, it was a big push from the students uh, everything happened thanks and because of the students uh, most of the time and that's uh, that was uh, the same and um uh, the, the the commitment was basically to to say okay we're gonna we're gonna have a carbon neutrality goal and we're, we're gonna set up some milestone and some some big items that will allow us to get there so uh, the carbon neutrality was 2060 I think it was really arbitrary and at the time pretty much everybody was doing the same <laughs> let's do carbon neutrality someday uh, we know now that we're gonna have to review that and actually I'm, I'm in the making of um, of getting a budget for a uh, um, Climate action plan with a third-party uh, consultant. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be accepted uh, to to review that because you know, science is telling us we need to hurry up. <laughs> so um, the the first milestone was 2020, and uh, we had to reduce 20% from the 2007 baseline of carbon emissions. So that's that's um, uh, part of the job. Uh, sustainability manager, sustainability officer, resilience officer that. A lot of what they do is report data. Uh, it's not only that, and thank God I'm doing all this stuff on the ground, but uh, it's uh, <clears throat> it's important, obviously, to know um, where we are and manage the, uh, our performance. So it's uh, it's going well, actually, in our performance. We're, we're, uh, we're at 20%. Um, and there, there, I have some news for you that we're going to go well above this in, 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 in a few months. So the way it, it happened is uh, the way we were able to, to do it mostly is what you see in the middle, uh, the commitment to LEED certification, LEED silver. So any building you see on campus that's new, it's LEED silver at the minimum. Right now, most of them are, are gold um, in general. Uh, creation of the Office of Sustainability, creation of the Student Government Eco Agency that um, is actually using student fee to uh, promote sustainability project. And uh, so the goal 20%, uh, if you look at the pie, most of the emissions are coming from, and it's not a big surprise, like pretty much everybody, local government, big corporation, it's buildings, um, mostly uh, electricity, purchased electricity. And, and we have uh, obviously other uh, emissions. I, I'd like people to, to start being a little bit more versed into um, the climate jargon because Sometimes you talk about scope one, scope two, scope three, and people you know, don't know exactly what you're talking about. So scope one is really anything that is uh, related to on-site uh, generation of emissions. So let's say if we had a co-generation power plant on campus, we would have a lot of uh, scope one emission. We don't, so we don't, we don't have a lot of scope one emissions. We have backup diesel uh, generators. We have a fleet, a very small fleet uh 25 percent electric actually with the gems so you know don't have a lot a lot of scope one the big chunk uh, and you see it in the yellow part is uh scope two so scope two is really a uh, purchased electricity uh, we don't 
uh, buy chilled water. Uh, we produce chilled water. Everything, everything. I mean, we have a little bit of natural gas for boilers, and but uh, it's mostly uh, it's mostly electricity. So uh, if we tackle this, we we can, you know, make a big dent in, in our emissions. The last scope three is really the headache for everyone. Uh, I'm part of a, the IV Plus uh, Sustainability uh, Group. It's uh, as its name uh, give you a hint. It's all the big uh, big shots in the in the country. And uh, even them, you know, the report that we put together is scope one and scope two for now. Uh, scope three is still an issue because we don't know what to put in that basket. Um, the, the official uh, way to account for scope three for us is what you see in the little uh, drawing. Uh, so we account for a study abroad. Uh, so right now it's a little limited. <laughs> Obviously, we're gonna have a big, big fall. Um, business travel uh, also. We have also uh, anything that is coming from landfill, uh, methane emissions. Uh, and, and at one point, we, I used to account for paper, for instance. Uh, I don't anymore because it's so small, <laughs> the emissions related to, to paper. But at the same time, if we account for paper, why not account for uh, t-shirts? Why not account for, because everything has a carbon footprint. If you see, uh, if, you, if you listen to, uh, uh, to experts, uh, there's a big, lie about carbon footprint where basically uh, we account for the emissions that we know we are responsible for but in the, in your life there's so much i mean one thing that we account in this particular greenhouse gas inventory is commuting also we, we account for commuting because it is indirectly linked directly but still linked to uh to our operations you know uh it's true it's anybody who wants to uh you know, bike to, to, to campus, they can do that, but it's tough. So uh, at the same time, we're kind of responsible for those emissions too. So we account for those commuting emissions too. Um, and, um, and that's kind of the, the picture we, we, we have right now. And the good news is that uh, by summer 2021, so in two months, pretty much in August uh, almost, uh, all those scope two emissions that you see are gonna be offset pretty much. Uh, why? Because uh, a year ago, we, we, we sat down with FPL and uh, looked at their Solar Together program, which is basically a way, I, I'm a resident of uh, Cutler Bay and I decided to use um, Solar Together. I don't have a rooftop solar, for instance, my neighbor has. Yeah, she, she's the ex-mayor of Cutler Bay, uh, Peggy Bell. Uh, but, uh, but for UM, for instance, a lot of people uh, we're asking, you know, uh, why don't you have more solar pa solar panels? I, I've always said, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's more of a the, the regional issue uh, and regulated market issue. Uh, but when FPL decided to become the first solar uh, producer in the in the country and make basically South Florida their their base, uh, we said, okay, well, let's see what you have to offer, and the offer was interesting. So. Um, so what we have is 100% of our elect electricity, uh, Rasmus, uh, Core Gables, and, uh, and the medical campus, not the satellites, because the turf of FPL is limited to the turf of FPL, but um, so everything that is really, really far, that's not, but uh, all those three campuses, 100% is gonna be, uh, is gonna be provided by uh, solar power. Uh, one of the main uh, new solar farm that you see uh, right now in Miami Dade is the one close to my house. Actually, it's a uh, homestead. I think it's four megawatt. And uh, the way it's going to work is every time we 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 procure one megawatt of uh, of electricity with FPL, uh, we'll get uh, renew renewable energy credits that will uh, be uh, our way to offset our carbon footprint, pretty much. Uh, so that's that's the good news. Uh, you, you'll see an article uh, in the news at the U coming up uh, April 12th, and we have a little um, on April 20th. Uh, I recommend you to uh, to RSVP. We'll have um, uh, our VP for our facilities, Jessica Bramley, asking questions to Jennifer Schaffer, uh, who's the di executive director for Solo Together from FPL. So it's gonna so, so as of as of. This summer, UM is going to be 100% from the solar fields down by the 
Wow, that's great news. And that's yeah, that's, that, that's crazy. I didn't think uh, that would happen in my lifetime, but yeah. Um, the um, I, you know, I, I took I was it took a flight out of uh, Tamiami Airport, and I was looking at that huge solar field. I was like, wow, I didn't know that that there was this massive solar field down there. Yeah, the, the, the way they set up the, the, the program, I mean, you, you're going to learn more if you listen to Jennifer Schaffer, she's the, she, she's the man, but um, she, it's basically that they, they're offering the big players in town, so I think I think the county jumped on, on the opportunity too. Um, some cities didn't, um, but uh, whatever, we'll see, uh, they, they, they have a second round of uh, offer. Uh, same thing, when I, uh, when I jumped on the, on the opportunity from my house, uh, it was closed in like five minutes. So I had to wake up at 5, uh, 5 a.m. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, that, yeah. One thing that I'd like to, to, uh, to, to just um, minimize is the fact that when we signed the contract, it was a year and a half ago, two years ago, and uh, not all the buildings were a part of it. So 100% except, except Lakeside Village, for instance. So it's not much. It's like 4% of our, of our electricity anyway. But uh, there's still room for rooftop solar to eliminate those 4% to become really 100% uh, renewable, 100%, uh, not virtually 100%. Uh, so I think uh, uh, there's still room for rooftop. And actually, uh, I'm working with the, with the student government to put an 80 kilowatt system on the, one of our buildings, pretty decent sized system that will be hopefully visible from the new Centennial Village. So. Um, this is uh this is the way about the solar uh, real quick i'm sorry yep so is there a cost savings to a university to do no. that as well no is i mean the, the cost there's a little bit of cost cost saving yeah no it's not like there's a payback or it's a i think it's a 20 years or 20 years contract or 30 years contract um you pay a little premium the the seven first years uh, very little and then and then you start saving but the saving are, are not you know it's not it's a contract. You you still pay FPL. You know it's not. I know. Uh, I'm just um, <clears throat> what I want to. Um, it's not a topic for this conversation, uh, but I just I just want to be clear that um, you know in my mind uh, FPNL doesn't come with clean hands. Um, you know most yeah. of the time, right? So the norm is that all of us should be getting solar power. And the norm is that I should be able to have my solar power, like I do, come and I don't pay FPNL. I get my solar power from the sun and I pay a $66 a month bill. But just like big corporations greenwash through their talk, I just I just want us to uh, you know be very clear about making sure that we hold that we hold companies that are monopolies and that have incredible sway on how consumers are allowed to access the free energy from the sun, as opposed to, and I'm being very critical because I have my beef with FPNL over the amendments they tried to um, yeah. pull over the eyes of our voters. So I have a real big beef with FPNL because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, <clears throat> it's about their bottom line. It always has been. Mm -hmm. So my point is, is that as an institution, I think it's important for us to make sure that we're not that while we celebrate this, amen, right? Like there's a huge chunk of fossil fuels that are no longer being pulled to our university, but let's let's not make that uh, a green light for them to sort of applauding them for what they should be doing now. Sure. No, I, I have to- in the way of- You're right, you're right. Yeah, so so th this uh, this effort accounts only for 14% of their portfolio, the goal, the, 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 the ultimate goal. Uh, you'll learn more when you listen to Jennifer, but it's true. Uh, they, they've been always uh, reluctant. What, they don't like rooftop solar, and they don't like. They have a regulated market, so you don't. You, you sell electricity in Florida, in Southeast Florida, you go to jail. You, you can't do that in, you know? in, in California and Arizona. So yeah, definitely. But at the That's same time, saying. It, they're not clean a, hands, and I just political issue. It's a lobby issue. So what what we have to do is work with them. And what what I see is that. It, it's tough to, to ask people to put solar, like even at UM, we, we could put solar on every roof that won't make a dent in terms of the, I, know, I mean, it I wouldn't know. make a dent definitely, but it won't be enough to, to, re, to answer the whole load that we need to power all those buildings, all that AC and all the utilities. So I see that Boston University, a bunch of our, our, our folks out there, they, they've done, 
a lot more than us in terms of rooftop, but they still are very, very, very far from 100% from, uh, from renewable. So what they have to do is actually do the same kind of, it's a offsite uh, renewable energy system. So they, they invest in the wind farms in their region. So this, this program is kind of the same. Um, it's basically we're helping FPL uh, putting together solar farms. Um, the, the good thing, uh, Xavier, is that net metering is still there. It's not going away. So, uh, so when we put this 80 kilowatt system uh, <laughs> from the student, we'll get the electricity back. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm just channeling Sila's voice. I, I first met uh, Sila as a strong advocate, uh, you know, speaking truth to power. And I just want to make sure that we model that at the university uh, and that and that we um, we you know use our you know our our role right as a as a major institution in this town to be able to uh, affect public policy. So it's it's just I think we have many challenges in many ways. That's what this underwater HOA is about. You know we could sit here and be lulled into thinking we're problem solving by raising a road or two. But there's a big crisis and we need true leadership that has a, a citizenry, in our case, a student body that can can see through stuff and ask the questions of, you know, what what is it that you're delivering and are we just giving you a pass so you can let your fossil fuel infrastructure get some more gains until we have to invest in the green. The good thing about the this one is that the, 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 the energy is actually coming from the solar plants, uh, which is not... Like uh, the same thing, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, I talked to them. The Duke, for instance, is big on carbon offset. What they do is they buy their way out. Know, There's no way to get to carbon neutrality without buying carbon offset. Uh, and, and actually for us, it's gonna be the same thing because we're gonna be scope three neutral, uh, sorry, scope two neutral. But we still have all those emissions from commuting, from everything that we indirectly incentivize. So for that and, and everything that we sponsor, you know, uh, travel and, and so it, it's going to be, it's hard. It's hard to, to get to carbon neutrality, but that's the goal. That's the goal, definitely. Um, I see a question about uh, the architects, which are um, uh, regarding the, the new buildings. So I'm going to talk about the, the, the new dorms in a second. Uh, I just wanted to go over this. So uh, when I came in, we, we didn't have any ranking. It's a really good tool, STARS. Uh, sustainability tracking assessment rating system for higher education uh, and it's uh, a way to really track everything from uh, operations and, and when I say operations grounds dining halls everything everything we do uh, they, they, they rate it and rank it um, on their sustainability performance so it's a it's it's a really good system uh, we're silver now we're gold and joining uh, the the the, the group of uh, universities like Yale, yeah, like Princeton, for instance, so uh, getting there. Um, so you know this guy. Um, I, I, I put it, this picture because um, we, we have to talk about what happened four years ago, uh, <laughs> dropping out of the Paris Agreement it was just crazy. And uh, we're back, thank God. Uh, at the time, we're, the We Are Still In movement uh, was created and Julio Frank uh, signed it. So that was a great thing. Now the We Are Still In movement became We Are All In movement. <laughs> so it's good. Uh, we have the best experts. Brian is one of them. Um, and uh, now with, the, with all the research uh, going on, it's not only uh, climate science, it's also uh, resilience. We have, we have a new MPS, um, uh, Master of Professional Science in uh, urban uh, resilience and sustainability. And they're gonna train the, the future uh, expert. They're gonna solve the issue, hopefully. So that's, uh, uh, I, I don't think I'm gonna do this because it's more like for students, this one. You know, what is green in this building? What, what I'm gonna say is that what you see on, in this building are two things. Uh, I think the gentleman was asking about um, the dorms. Uh, you see a green roof. I'm not going to talk about solar, we already did, but the green roof, we uh, actually have green roof now on campus, on the Lakeside Village, and I'm going to show you uh, this in a second. What I wanted to ask you is, what do you think is, and pro probably you know, but whatever, the, the little orange stuff on the left, what do you think it is? 
Is it water Orange. catchment? What is it? And water catchment? Yeah, Jamal. Yeah, that's your thing. So yes, it is. And uh, for big buildings, it is um, um, a little bit more challenging, obviously, because uh, the, the idea is to capture the rainwater, filter it a little bit um, to irrigate the landscaping areas, but also to send it back to uh, flush the toilets. And uh, that's a little bit more challenging. Uh, it's more expensive, obviously, but uh, it should be the should be the norm, right? Because uh, it doesn't make sense to flush toilet with the <laughs> pristine drinkable water. But that's, yeah. Uh, so the good thing is we have something like this at UM. Uh, the, this is the Frost School of Music Studio uh, North and South. Uh, when I came in, it got certified lead platinum. So that's the top of the line. Um, we have to thank the Frost family, obviously, for this, because they're the one who asked for uh, like uh, wow features. And uh, one of them is the rainwater harvesting system. When you flush the toilet at frost, you flush it with rainwater. That's pretty cool. And uh, they, they have those uh, beautiful uh, windows that are electrochromatic that darken with the automatically uh, when the, uh, there's too much sun. So you don't have to turn the blind or forget about it. Or, yeah, it's, uh, it's a way to save energy also. Uh, 70 kilowatts uh, system on top of the roof. So that's offsetting probably 35 to 40% of the load. So what I was telling you a little bit before, looks like a huge system. It's occupying almost the whole the whole roof, but it, it, it's taking care of 40%, uh, which is great in itself. But, and you have also this titanium dioxide coating around the building. That's another uh, kind of show off feature because uh, we don't have that much uh, air pollution in, in, in Miami compared to Denver or, or Los Angeles. But that's a way to actually uh, also have the same kind of function as a catalytic converter in your car. They break down um, NOx. Um, and so that's the, that's the idea. Uh, so really, really cool building. And if you, if you, if you go there, uh, probably this summer, you'll have like a little uh, QR code with uh, a 360, uh, no, 180 uh, virtual tour that the School of Communication uh, did for me, a really great project we did together. So this is what the, uh, the gentleman was asking for, um, dorms. Uh, this is probably the, the new jewel uh, of UM on campus, Lakeside Village opened in fall 2020. Uh, you see the green roof. Uh, right now they're kind of yellow, actually. Uh, it's, uh, they need maintenance uh, because uh, you can imagine there's a lot of, uh, and, and it's not like free access. It's really something that's maintained by our grounds team and uh, the people that are the consultant for those green roof. So it, it's, um, it's not like you can go and, and plant tomatoes there, but actually uh, there was tomatoes growing. I don't know who went there at one point, but there was uh, some tomatoes growing on, the, on that roof. So uh, it's built on stilts. So the whole thing was to uh, uh, also build with sea level rise in mind. Again, uh, just like uh, Xavier was saying, uh, with elevating one, one road, it's not going to solve the problem. So elevating this, um, this complex is great. Uh, but uh, I think it's more like of a statement. And it's beautiful. Definitely, it's a, it's, it's a marvelous piece of architecture. A lot of rain garden, a lot of uh, local native uh, habitat. So we have a resurgence of the Atala butterfly at Lakeside Village. That's pretty amazing. I was looking for Atala butterfly everywhere uh, five years from now and, and not seeing any because we have a lot of Kunti everywhere. That's what they, what they eat. Uh, nothing. And now they're at Lakeside, so really happy. Uh, our grounds team are not that happy because they, they ate all the Kunti, but whatever, we're, we're gonna fix that. Uh, this is not a, a, a new building. The lead mandate is really for new buildings. And um, this is an old building. Uh, in a sense, it's the School of Business, Herbert uh, Miami School of Business. Uh, and they recently decided to go uh, lead operation and maintenance. Uh, they got gold. Uh, it's going to be tough to, to, to keep because we realized that uh, some assumptions we made for chilled water was not really correct. So we'll need to, uh, to fix that. Um, but uh, the good thing is we have a true leader uh, at the school. Dean Quelch has a vision. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you that 
you know, the, since he's been there, a, a big, big changes ha ha have happened. So um, that's actually the reason why we have this certifications because uh, in, in two years ago, we launched, he launched now, the whole team, David Kelly and Daniel Hicks, a lot of people launched the MS in sustainable business at the School uh, of Business. And the, the, the rational was, you know, we need to walk the talk pretty much. And I think, uh, I think Jamal saw me uh, <laughs> do the, we started uh, dumpster diving for the, for this, uh, for this certification. That was fun. Uh, so talking about uh, the, the School of Business, that's really the, the, the new big thing, but there's so many other offering. Oh, sorry, I'm going. Um, so many, so many things just like last month, it was approved. The, the Department of Geography is going to be rebranded, renamed uh, Department of Geography instead of and regional studies that nobody knew exactly what it meant. Uh, it's going to be uh, geography and sustainable development. So uh, that's that's amazing because um, uh, that that's what they've been doing for a long time, teaching sustainable development. But having this this decision to make it official, I think uh, it's great. They're gonna probably launch a minor. I'm, I have to meet with the Professor Moise to um, to brainstorm the way we're gonna we're gonna do that. Uh, a minor in sustainable development. So that's that's a, there's a, already a minor in sustainable business at the School of Business. We have the MPS in urban resilience and sustainability. Recently, also the Master of Science in Climate and Health, uh, launched by uh, Dr. Kumar. You know, that's another great uh, new offering. And, and many others. Uh, I know that uh, Jamal and Adam uh, graduated or are graduating from the Master of, um, uh, of Arts in Environment, Culture and Media. So um, I yep. have a question. Sorry. Yep. Dr. Kumar is launching Master of Science in Climate and Health out of the business school? No, I'm sorry. It's not the business school. It's the whole UM. So that's that's uh, the uh, Miller School of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, OK, but it's Dr. Kumar? Yeah, Dr. Kumar is a, is a public health. So that's a uh, very uh, cool. Yeah, no, no, it's it's amazing. Yeah, we have a, we have a lot, a lot of, uh, uh, and and you see the the little uh, you see Prince Charles there. Yeah, you're not, you're not so dreaming. Nice. You're not dreaming. Actually, Dean Welch, <laughs> I don't know how how he did it, but uh, he, he asked him to uh, to do a little statement uh, for the 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 symposium we had two days ago uh, or last week. I forgot uh, Chief Sustainability Officer Symposium. So. That's that's a pretty amazing. And Ulink, uh, Xavier is part of a, at least one Ulink team, uh, maybe others, and it's a it's a, it's a great interdisciplinary uh, research launch uh, a few years ago at, at UM. And most of them, I would say, are focusing on sustainable development issues. Uh, this is uh, a, a little busy. I'm sorry. Uh, but if you look at the, the slide on the upper left, that's the waste diversion rate from last January. Um, so we're far from um, Stanford or Duke or <laughs> because over there they have uh, composting facilities, even in Orlando, they have Orlando is a pretty, pretty cool city in terms of uh, sustainability. Uh, they have composting facility, industrial composting facility, and that's really what account for a lot of the, the waste, municipal solid waste. Uh, so uh, we still have a long way to go, but um, uh, but we do everything we can to divert waste from landfill. Um, and you see, for instance, the, the little video that Adam did uh, a few years ago on the surplus uh, warehouse. So everything uh, that we, want to get rid of in terms of furniture, computers, nothing go to landfill. It's resold, repurposed. Uh, we make money actually out, out of it. Um, we have the toner uh, cartridge recycling program. Uh, I mean, you name it, um, try to recycle and divert uh, as much as we can. This shut the sash uh, thing is just to, to also say that we, we try to save uh, on the energy that is wasted. And a big thing in the Green Lab program that we promote um, mostly on the Miller School of Medicine, but a little bit elsewhere, uh, is to tell people, tell PIs, tell tell uh, lab managers that they know usually, but uh, to shut the sash. There's a lot of energy that can be saved by just making a few gestures, just like turning off the light, but here is shut the sash. 
And uh, once you when, once we talk about repurposing, reusing, uh, people ask me always about recycling. There is no other way. Um, it's really the last option. You've seen the the, the movie from PV from PBS, uh, Plastic Wars. Uh, recycling is not going well. Um, but what, whatever we can do to uh, to at least do our part, you know. So that's uh, that's part of the the deal. We need to have consist consistent labeling consistent kind of uh, bins everywhere. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, and I have actually a, a little video that uh, 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 gonna explain kind of uh, the, the journey of a water bottle. It's a fun video, so uh, it's not very long. I'm gonna show it to you. Let me know if you hear the sound. Uh, sorry. challenges we face not just with Miami-Dade County but just in general in the recycling industry is contamination. Contamination is defined as any item that's not accepted on the recycling acceptability list. Plastic bags. We get a lot of plastic bags that jam our equipment and slow down the process. Food waste is another big issue. People put containers in their recycling or plastic bottles with soda or food still in it. It, it makes the other items like paper very unclean. Recycle all paper products, all plastic bottles, aluminum cans, make sure they're clean and dry and empty. Try not to use single-use plastics. All right. Let me see if I can go. Duck. Yep. Yeah. So you, you, you saw the movie. Uh, now let's be real. Um, 
a lot of cities are dropping recycling. It's becoming too expensive. It's a mess. Um, and this is not talking about glass, for instance. That's just a, <laughs> the, the one thing that we thought would, you know, needed to be recycled and easy to recycle. It's not actually. So uh, a lot of issue with the recycling industry. Um, waste management is is guaranteeing us that they don't sell it to Southeast Asia, that they have local markets. Um, but um, but definitely uh, things need to change. Uh, the single stream recycling uh, basically baked in the whole contamination problem. So uh, it's working in other countries. Um, in, in, uh, in many other countries, uh, people have to go somewhere to recycle their bottles here. And, there, and you have a real um, sorting system. Uh, probably will go back to some kind of uh, dual stream or several stream kind of system. I don't know. I don't know got, what's going to happen, but um, obviously it's more expensive. The way we, the, the reason why we went to single stream is because it, <laughs> it made more sense for waste management. It's less money for them to spend uh, for the pickup. But uh, for now, at least that's the system we have. Let's try to at least not contaminate. Uh, so uh, little. Uh, a uh, little something about uh, ECO, that's the Student Government uh, ECO Board who, who, who was um, created in 2008, I think it was, and uh, have, have done a lot on campus to promote sustainability projects. So that's the 20 kilowatt on top of the, the food court of setting probably 18 to 20% of the load uh, of the food court. So not bad. Um, we tell people to, uh, and you saw the video, uh, my friend uh, Shiraz is always telling people uh, to get rid of single-use plastic. Easier, easier said than done, obviously. Uh, we had a ban on single-use plastic and styrofoam in Coral Gables. Since then, uh, it's been repealed. So uh, going back to what Xavier was saying about FPL, it's all about you know legal battle and, and policy making, which is hard. It's hard. Uh, the the grocery industry they had really strong attorneys in Tallahassee and. Core Gables lost the, the battle. But um, at UM, at least, we still stick to the to, to the ban. And so we don't have uh, plastic bags and, and styrofoam. So we try to tell students to do the same, to only reuse. Um, not always easy. Uh, if you go to the dining hall, sometimes you have to-go boxes that are just plastic, which is strange because when you get to, uh, to the food court, uh, Panda Express and others, they have actually a, a paper-based boxes and like compostable boxes. So we hope to harmonize everything. And by next year, when we get out of COVID, COVID was really horrible for single-use plastic. But uh, hopefully we, we, we get to a point where we'll have very, very few items single-use plastic on campus and hopefully none. Uh, a little, uh, a little uh, hello to our folks from the Miller School of Medicine, the, the U Health System. Um, I'm not involved as much, but uh, I still um, I'm on, on their campus once a, a week, once every two weeks. Um, so we've done several initiatives in the hospitals trying to green the, the OR. Um, they, need, they need someone over there probably to do that. Um, but um, we've done really cool things uh, recently. One of them is the creation of an urban food garden uh, in the middle of the campus, right in front of the Calder Library. So uh, yes, it's me right there, planting a, a miracle fruit um, tree. So miracle fruit, you know, probably if you went to the Fruit and Spice Park, um, it's something that's going to change everything, the taste of every, everything that you eat. And for a cancer patient, it's, uh, it can be useful. Uh, and so uh, we work with the with the cancer support services and Dr. Poso Kaderman um, over there at Sylvester Cancer Center to to do that. And, um, and now we have a little food forest growing. You're going to be happy, uh, Jamal. It's uh, it's really a, the idea is really a permaculture kind of garden. You have the raised bed because the raised bed was also part of the deal is for them to grow herbs that they can use in their cooking demo for their uh, patient. So cancer patients have special diets and um, they're going to try to use the, the herbs from, from the garden. So that's, that's nice. And talking about garden, so we have a lot going on on the main campus. We also have something on the Rasmus campus, um, but uh, the, the, the garden is managed by the lady that you see on the screen, uh, Dr. Hood. 
from international studies, uh, we have a coffee ground program. So everything coming from Starbucks is going to the garden. Not everything, because at one point it was just smelling like a brewery uh, in the garden. So we had to stop the coffee. It was too much. <laughs> but uh, uh, talk about food waste diversion. Uh, there's a really great um, organization on campus called Food Recovery Network. It's a national organization. But we have a chapter that recently, uh, a year ago, launched a food alert system. So basically, when students are organizing an event, they know they're going to have food waste at the end of the event. They send a little something, a text to this organization that will send it to all the what, what we identified as food insecure students. So students that receive, for instance, financial aid, they've been selected. Nobody knows they're, they're, they're in that list, but it, it can be sensitive, obviously. So they receive that alert that says, OK, from 2 to 2.30, go there, have free sandwich. So that's, that's a really cool system uh, with an app uh that they, they created there's a food pantry now also available uh on the second floor of uh of the uc so same thing that's the same organization um we recently uh, with computer science we have a great partnership with dr ramamurti um uh, is an app specialist he create apps for everybody and uh, his his students are really amazing and we actually did together this future, food future hack in partnership with the um, EPA, the Florida Department of Environmental uh, uh, Protection, and uh, Broward Schools County. Uh, no, Broward County Schools. Sorry. And um, and it was amazing. We we had like uh, universities and high schoolers, uh, students, uh, offering really out of the box idea on how to fix food waste with uh, with an app, for instance. Uh, you see composting, so we don't have industrial composting, but we still have a composting program. So we now have three tumblers uh, in the garden, and we're actually um, uh, recycling, uh, composting most, uh, I would say 25 residents at University Village have a bucket that they can uh, drop off at the compost site. We are also composting the, the stuff from the smoothie um, in the farmer's market, and we have a new smoothie king at Lakeside Village. So we're also composting there, the, the banana mostly. But uh, so we're you know, trying to, 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 to do our best. Not do, gonna do talk about, work, sorry, uh, Jamal. Do you work with the, the grounds crew, the, the landscapers? Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they provide the wood chip so that we were able to, uh, to have the right dose you know, of food scrap versus uh, brown. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we have like a little pile of uh, wood chip and uh, vegetative debris. The, the, most of it is recycled uh, because they send it to a, um, for that wood recycling. And they, what they do is they, they do mulch and they sell it to landscapers. And uh, okay. sometimes they also send it as wood pellet to the Florida crystal uh, plant in uh, near Okeechobee. You know, the, the Florida uh, crystal sugar industry. They, they usually use the bagasse to power their, 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 their plant. But in the winter, when the harvest is gone, they, they have to use some kind of wood. So that's the vegetative debris that we send over there. They make, make that in wood pellet and they, and they sell it to uh, Florida, uh, Florida crystals. So that's a good partnership um, going on. A lot of events. Uh, the next one that you cannot miss is uh, in two weeks, Earth, Earth Week. Um, something I wanted to talk about because uh, it's, it's something that happened uh, in the last four years that I'm really happy about uh, it's the greening of the athletics department um, and, and greening is a big word because we, we still need to do a lot but still um, recently uh, for instance um, Blake James um, uh, delivered uh, an announcement that he, uh, he was committing to the UN United Nation uh, Sports for Climate Action commitment so it's it's kind of aligning with our commitment already with Second Nature uh, but it's it's good to see uh, to hear uh, athletics. It's like uh, recently we had a video uh, on how to learn to live plastic free and respect our, our beaches, and it was Coach Diaz who was uh, actually uh, saying those words. So it's one thing for me to tell people <laughs> they know already. Uh, when Coach Diaz says it, it's it's different. It has bigger impact. So it's it's a great partnership uh, that we have with the athletics. This is a. a a quote that I love, that's why I put it on the on the website. It makes far better sense to reshape ourselves to fit a finite planet 
than to attempt to reshape the planet to fit our infinite wants. Beautiful. And that all the events that we have. And that's the website. So I don't know if it was too long. No, no, not at all. That was great. Thank you, Teddy. And we, and there is a there is a question in the chat box for you. I can, I'm happy to read it. Uh, uh. It's from it's from Christina. She goes, what are the long term solutions in your view regarding recycling of glass, bearing in mind that it's not economically viable? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to what Xavier was saying about uh, electricity. Um, there's a lot of markets that are regulated. There's a lot of regulations. Uh, the bottle industry was able to get away with quitting glass because it makes more sense. They make more money out of plastic. Um, but uh, it might require a policy, might require a, a law that says, okay, um, just like what they have in Vermont in, in Maine, where uh, you have a bottle bill, where um, the, the bottling industry, they have to provide it uh, to, to, to provide incentive for people to, um, to get their, um, how do you call that? The re Someone help me. The little sense that you get back from the bottle. The deposit. Deposit, right. So yeah, uh, I, I mean, uh, that should be the norm in every state in the US. Yeah. Not. But, uh, you know, I think that's that's a simple idea. I mean, we, we used to do it. So let's go back to what we used to do. That's it's as simple as that, really. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That was passed in Michigan, where I come from, with, with the Citizen Initiative. And it's probably the most popular initiative that, that had been passed over the decades. I mean, it was huge for cleaning up roadside waste in, in the state. Yeah. It, it's just a... Uh, the beverage industry and the bog, the distributors hated it, but they fought against it like crazy. Yeah, of course, of course, and uh, and that's why you need you need political will because you'll get a lot of fire back. That's for sure. Just like uh, FPL fought uh, a lot for uh, against rooftop solar uh, or deregulation, and the same uh, the same with the plastic bags and the retail industry. I mean, yeah, you, you'll get a, you'll get in trouble. So you have to prepare for. <laughs> Or uh, for a fight, yeah. So I have a question. Um, so yeah, that was my mom's comment. And so since recently, we're not allowed to recycle glass in our building anymore. I was wondering if any of you like knew of any place in Miami where you can bring bottles, like glass bottles or glass containers that can be recycled. Because I know Miami Dade recycles glass. No, but uh, you know the, what? Uh, I'm gonna answer that question, Sila, because. When you say Miami Dade, most of everything that we recycle in the in the county, they go to the same places. Um, and Pembroke Pines is one of it's the biggest in the uh, in the state, actually, biggest recycling plant. The issue with glass is that I don't know why they didn't understand that from the beginning. That putting glass in a compactor is going to break it into pieces that will make a mess out of the rest, just like food. Uh, so it's, the glass becomes a contamination issue for the rest of the recycling. It's, it doesn't make sense. They, they should have thought about this before. But anyway, uh, what, what I've seen and what Shiraz showed me is uh, they found a way to use it a little bit. So I still put it into uh, the, the recycling because at the end, they, they put that aside. And everything that is crushed, that is unsellable, they cannot really recycle glass that has, has been crushed and into pieces and it's a tissue. So they, they actually uh, use it as a filler. You know, for, land, for landfills, they need to cover uh, the, the, the wood with the layers of soil and, 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 um, and sand. So instead of sand, they use that, that glass, broken glass, so that the bulldozer can 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 go on top of those layers and on adding waste. So it's definitely not uh, super sustainable, but there's a end of life to this uh, glass. Hmm. So they don't, yeah, like the recycling that we do in Europe, where we bring it to those like containers yeah, no, no. doesn't exist here. No, I think that's that's a simple solution. We need to go back to this, but. Um, uh, what I'm trying to do at UM is, uh, but it's small scale, so it's not gonna, you know, it, it's just to have, 
I tried to work with Jenna Efrain. Uh, she's a, a professor of art. Um, she does a glass culture to to invest in a in a crusher, you know, a bottle crusher, so that she can uh, have um, raw material for glass culture. Um, again, it would be it would is a very, very small footprint anyway on the amount of glass that is generated. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's the kind of idea that we need to follow. Um, do you know if UM is invested or if there's any discussion surrounding the divestment from fossil yes. fuels? Yes, SILA was a, was a part of a climate reality project and uh, it's actually something that they brought to uh, our treasurer. And um, I don't know, honestly, I don't know if, uh, if UM will uh, divest. Uh, UM is considering, um, it's not official, but they're, they're, they're considering actually, they told me already, uh, government relation told me that they, they, they would um, support the, uh, what's the name of the, the carbon dividend bill, the one from uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. So that's another kind of, uh, of issue, but it's the same idea as we need to tackle the problem at its root. The, the, and it, the root of the problem is that polluters are not uh, paying for the pollution. And so the, having a carbon tax, and they call it the carbon dividend, but it's, it's the same idea. Uh, we we could, could at least level the, the playing field. Um, regarding divestment, it's, it's a little tougher because you, you, you put yourself as a, you could put yourself at disadvantage. But when you listen to finance specialists, they're actually saying that the, the people are divesting are making more money. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not an expert, but uh, I know that Sila met with our treasurer. It was really receptive. Uh, mm -hmm. tell, tell me if I'm wrong, uh, Sila. Yeah. Yeah, like the, I think nothing has changed since the first time we met with him. No. I'm not, um, like, I, I don't exactly know what's happening right now since I'm not at UM anymore. Um, and I haven't talked to the co-presidents of Climate Reality recently, but um, last time they, went, they met with him was, I think, in January. And it's always the same speech of, um, like, they're willing to listen to us. They're, they're liking the idea, but they can't tell us that they're gonna do it they can't um it's just yeah it's always the same thing it's they want to go broader that's what they keep telling us what broader means they can't really tell us uh so it's it's been back and forth like that but we're continue while climate reality keeps pushing and there's been a lot of universities recently that have the divested so maybe yeah. that will help convincing our university um to do it as well but. Yeah, because I was talking to some uh, experts from actually the, the one that started it. Um, I, I think Stanford started it. Do you know, Sila? I'm not sure, but I, I don't think Stanford has fully divested. I think they've partly they started. It. And bottom line, they, they were saying that the divesting from coal uh, is the first step. And it's not that complicated, actually, because a lot of the 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 arguments are that it's it's too complicated because it's bundled into a uh, hedge funds and so at that point I'm I'm not sure because I don't know anything about finance but uh, but the the doesn't look like that complicated actually um, so mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. I hope I hope um, Sila if you stay here um, in Miami if you don't move. Uh, get back to uh, to to uh, Brian and and Luke and and see if uh, we can reboot this. I mean, with COVID, everything has been like uh, walked off. Yeah, bit. it's been put on pause. Like yeah. they've been so focused with COVID that. Yeah. but I, I would say something, Sila. Your efforts has not been in vain because when they say uh, we need to go bigger, I'm not sure exactly also what it it means. But I know that in my case, it means that the 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 they'll put a little bit more budget into the sustainability office. So I guess that's okay. something positive out of it. Yeah, no, I think there's like some hope. I'm I'm not like completely hopeless about this, but um, it's just been pushed back many times. Like like one no. of the reasons was the COVID pandemic, which makes sense. Um, but yes, they they want to have a conversation about it with the board of trustees. So those are like pretty good steps I think five or six years ago probably wouldn't even have happened at all yeah. uh, so our treasure at least is open to 
ideas and open to listen. That's good. Are there any other questions at the moment? Otherwise, I think it's it's eight fifteen, so we can probably wrap things up. Uh, Xavier, Brian, any closing comments? I uh, know. I hope everybody has a good week and get out there. And yeah, I nothing to say. <laughs> nothing further to say. And for me, Teddy, I uh, first of all thank oh, thanks all to the members and everyone in the team. But Teddy, obviously, on behalf of all of us, thank you for your leadership at the university. I mean, it's really been extraordinary uh, from up close. You, I remember when I first joined the university, my very first meeting at Leila Center was with you. It's like, okay, how do I navigate through all of this? So uh, uh, you're of great value to the university and all the work you're doing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. Right, have a good night. Oh, yeah, you too, huh? Bye, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye.